Okay. We'll continue the second part of the course. What I want to talk here about is the importance of biomedical imaging or bioimaging, and then I'll end the course with some examples to give you an idea what we're talking about. So if we think about life sciences and biology nowadays, just subtract out anything that has to do with imaging, you're not going to be left with much. Some things you might not think of them as imaging, but they are actually also imaging techniques. And so actually today, studying life sciences, life science research and technology without bioimaging is basically unthinkable. And the, one of the major reasons is you can study the system with minimal perturbation. So you as a subject can go into a scanner, we can study your tissue properties, you can go in as a patient, it is minimal perturbation, you can study the system in situ, in vivo, and that is one of the major reasons why it has taken such an important role today. So I'll give you some examples. Of course, humans, subjects, patients, animals, transgenic animals. You know, classical ways are to take the tissue, cut it, stain it, classify it, and each time you cut and stain an animal, you have to take another one for the next section, for the next time point, etc. Imaging does that for you on the same animal. You have cell organ preparations. So those are examples. You can take the cell preparation, study it, organs, refused organs, for example. So modalities, X-ray, computed tomography, positron emission tomography, those are the ones we're going to cover here in the course, magnetic resonance and ultrasound. There's also, for brain imaging, there is imaging electrical currents or dipoles with electroencephalography, EEG, or magnetoencephalography. We're not going to cover those two techniques in this course. We're not going to cover optical imaging techniques. There is plenty of courses, biomicroscopy on the course. We'd be duplicating uh, that subject. So there's optical imaging, of course, and that's, we're not covering. And now, physics is the science of observation. So developing these imaging techniques is unthinkable without physical concepts. So those two things have to go together. You have on one hand the needs, the interests on biological research, life science research, and you have the capabilities that come from the physical laws that have essentially to a large extent defined the modalities that we can use and also how they are being used. And as you'll see in the course, what we can do with physics, what we want to do with life sciences and what we can do in the context of the living organism that pretty much will define what the instrument will look like and what it can do and what it cannot do. So those things go to, together hand in hand. So what are the essential elements of bioimaging? Well, if it's bio, we need life sciences. So here are two examples, neuroscience, cancer, two fields. We have, of course, other fields. We need physics. We need electrodynamics. We will talk about quantum mechanics. We won't give a course on quantum mechanics, but what the intent of this course is to show where these elements come into play. Thermodynamics come into play and classical mechanics. So we'll go by all the way back for those who are from the EPFL, we'll go all the way back to the first semester of the curriculum this year. Then physics and life sciences doesn't give us an instrument. We need engineering. So we need electrical, mechanical engineering, biomedical engineering. We need those as well. Mathematics. I already mentioned matrices. So linear algebra is central 
matrix calculations, etc., is central here, but also other mathematical uh, operations. Fourier transformation is another example that we take advantage on. And chemistry, biological chemistry, organic chemistry. Where do we use that? Well, we're going to talk about that during the course. There are molecules that we can inject into the organism. We can modify the molecules so that they change the contrast. And that's where chemistry comes into play. So we're essentially very, to look at the bioimaging field, we're very varied. We're depending on many mechanisms, or we have to try to understand many um, fields. So multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarity is important for this. But for that, we have a brain, you know, a brain can do many things. It can see, it can hear, it can smell and taste all at the same time, and it can think as well. So we're pretty much adapted here to this kind of challenge uh, as an engineering school. So we just got to think about that our brain has all these different areas from these different fields that we've been exposed to. We're not going to do a course on biochemistry. We're not going to do a course on on quantum mechanics, but we'll touch on these fields and we'll show where these things come in into play. Okay. So, if you want to develop the perfect bioimaging modality, what should it be able to do? Think of it, you want to diagnose a patient. Should be safe. Should be safe. Yeah. Non-invasive, non yeah. That's good. Fast. Fast. Cheap. Cheap. That's, that's an important point, too. What else? You kind of touched on it, non-invasive. It should be able to do it at a distance, portable, right? So portable, fast, cheap, precise. We want that too, right? Okay, this one's portable. Fairly cheap, would you agree? Sufficiently cheap? Well, this is about, what is it nowadays? This is a four, no, it's a four. You know, four, we're at six now, right? The ones from Apple. This is a four, I think. Um, a few hundred Swiss francs. Okay. A scan of an MRI costs about a thousand francs. Well, that's pretty cheap taking a picture with this one. All right. So if I had a device like this one, I'll point it to you back there and I'll give you your genetic mutation diagnosed on this distance. Right? That would, be the, that would be the kind of thing we want. Cheap, because taking a picture on this, as we see all, with all the selfies floating around, Snapchat and all these things, that's basically free. Right? So if I had a thing where I could do that, I'll do the genetic diagnosis on you back there. Or, you know, if you have a cold, I'll tell you exactly what influenza virus that you have on this distance. With zero error, that would be the perfect modality. Okay, now does that exist? No. Wrong. It does exist. Okay, so easy to use, we've said. Portable, high sen sensitive, provides good contrast. So, I have an example of that. There he is. You see, it's portable. What he holds in his hand is a tricorder. It's a very old American series from the 60s, 70s, Star Trek, huh? first generation. So this is, oh, what's the actors called? Captain Kirk. And as the chief medical officer, he's reading some life science readings on this little device. They follow the life science readings so they can detect if there's a living being a few hundred meters away. Actually, on planet surfaces, they can detect them. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. All right, so it exists in the movies. Well, basically, that's what we like to do. Actually, this is a simulated thing that detects, that you can buy, that detects people nearby. It's, I think it's mainly simulated, but I found that somewhere on YouTube. Okay, so what is the closest thing that we have? This is actually fairly close, and this is from an aquarium in Florida. And what they're going to do is take images of a pregnant dolphin. Here's the dolphin. This is the ultrasound measurement. The dolphin is in the water. He's got the cameras in the, like glasses here. So this is actually the scanner. This is what he sees here. We're going to talk about those artifacts that we saw there, the streaking artifacts. Well, basically, the veterinarian here, he wants to ascertain that the dolphin, who is pregnant, is in good health and that the fetus is growing um, as it should. So that is close to what we want. Sufficiently precise. It's still fairly cheap. It's sufficiently non-invasive that they can do the scan with a dolphin in the water in its environment. Okay, and so since there is no free lunch, and this is what we have to deal with, every imaging technique, every modality has its strengths and its weaknesses. For one thing, one modality is better than for the other. And what I hope that you'll appreciate in this course is what, what I'm going to try to give you is these strengths and weaknesses. What does which technique provide you that the other can't and vice versa? Um, and why? What are the reasons behind that we use ultrasound here? Why are the reasons why we use for other techniques, for other measurements, X-ray techniques, etc.? So to finish off with a few examples, this is um, autoradiography. Now, autoradiography means self-radiography. So what you do here is you take a, a, a substance like a protein, you label it with a radioactive marker, you run it through a gel, so the protein will just start to migrate through this gel up here, and then with the spiritual markers you can determine the molecular weight of the protein. So here these proteins are around 55 kilodalton. Here, here's one with 61, etc. That's also a way of, of imaging here of a gel. Then here's a brain slice. So they here the, the animal, and this looks pretty much like some monkey, was injected with a radioactive substance. Then the brain was extracted, cut in slices. The slices were put on, on an X-ray film, and they were imaged. And here one can see different structures. Here's the cerebellum. For example, substantia nigra, the white matter of the brain is here. So it's a cut like this, like this through the head. Here's another example. Now looking at, again at the brain, different uptake of a substance at the surface. Where it's dark, there's more uptake of it. And here, a very famous example of a monkey brain. What you see here is the uptake of glucose into the brain. This is the structure. The glucose had a, has a radioactive tracer. The monkey, while it was alive and receiving the substance, was looking at this picture. And this is the uptake of that glucose into its visual cortex. That is a part of the brain that pro processes visual information. So you can actually see the subject, what the subject sees has actually a geometric representation in the brain. And people have now, with magnetic resonance imaging techniques from MIT, have actually reproduced the letter M that you, when you look at the letter M, you see the letter M in the brain, where it's activated. So what are the advantages of imaging compared to tissue analysis? And here's an example of mice subjected to stroke that was used, assessed with MRI before, that's here, three, uh, three seven, and um, Wait a second, three, seven, and um, 24 hours later. And at the end of the 24 hours, the tissue was fixed and the number of neurons was stained for neurons. So here, where it's white, there's neurons where they're lost. So if one looks through, through, through time here, um, one sees these different slices here, but in the end, you can only cut once. So what you can do with imaging is, you can look at time zero, three hours, seven hours, 24 hours, 
uh, one can see the evolution in the same animal. So that has two advantages. It reduces the number of animals for animal research. Second, because it is a trend, it's a longitudinal stu study and not a cross-sectional study, it increases statistical power. So relative to histology or invasive tissues and an analysis, it is a rapid acquisition of the information, typically fairly fast. It is non-destructive. It is in situ or in vivo, and you can do it multiple times on the same subject, typically. So here is an example of ultrasound of the mouse heart. So this is a beating mouse heart here. Imagine how small a mouse is. Now think of a mouse heart. So, and what you heard is, it's a micro ultrasound device. So the ultrasound technique that we use in dolphins and humans had to be adapted for the mouse in the same. Uh, so that's also what we're gonna see in the course. Here's some examples from the human. This is 3D rendering of an MRI for surgical planning. <laughs> So you go through the data set and then it opens up and you see from the contrast in the computer you can render this and you can see the location of the tumor here and you have here the fiduciary marks so that's a structure that's put to the patient's head that indicates the exact position of the head and with that the surgeon can steer taxically with coordinates locate exactly the tumor based on the image contrast what the surgeon is confronted with when he cuts open the tissue, very often the tumor visually presents with the exact same appearance as the normal tissue. So it's sometimes very difficult to separate those. Here's an example from positron emission tomography. What is used today in our hospitals, this is metas metastasis localization. Here, this point should not be here. So this person here has a metastasis developing. This is actually glucose uptake, so the brain is high. We use a lot of glucose. And actually the bladder is also high because the injected radioactive glucose is secreted into the bladder, into urine. And then we have brain activation studies with MRI, so-called functional MRI studies. These are some of the very early three-dimensional three, three functional brain imaging studies. Everything is, that's in red are brain areas that are activated in this particular mem memory retrieval task. Okay, so what's next today? Um, we're offering you a tour of the CIBM and the assistants are up there. So we have Elise, Masume, and Guillaume. So they'll be happy to, you, you're gonna wait in front of the CE 104. Yeah, so you can pick up the X problem sheets there. Those who want to go and look at the imaging center, two of the assistants will accompany you and the third one will stay. Um, with you in the exercise room if you want to prefer to work on the problem sets. I would normally also come to the exercise session, but today I have a course to attend to, so um, we won't do it today. And that's it for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>